So it looks like the general public has kind of had it with real estate. Are we at inflection point with things that are going to happen in the next few months? Welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Today is July the 20th. Randy Patrick here putting realism back into the real estate market, right? That's what we want to hear. Why? Because we know what's going on out there. We know the information's not that great. There's a lot of narratives chipping away at our sanity basically all right uh that's the scoop so uh one thing i want to do announce right away is that on wednesday which basically is tomorrow if you're watching this video today on tuesday so wednesday the 21st of july i'm doing a live stream on my facebook page it's housing bubble 2 is a facebook page 8 p.m eastern time 5 p.m ps time basically it's how the housing market will play out it's the update now that we actually have an end date with respect to the you know the foreclosure moratorium, we have an end date with eviction moratoriums and things like that. States that are opening up, really uh, a good time to review what's going to happen. I'm going to lay out exactly how the things are going to play out step by step, so you'll have a good appreciation of what to look forward to over the coming months and the coming years as the housing market starts its shift. So please check it out if you can't listen. I realize people are going to say I don't do. The Facebook and I get that I'm looking at alternative things for the future uh, so you know this probably might be the last one we'll do on that medium and we'll move to something else I'm just you know it takes time to plan things out but just give you a heads up this will be something you do want to listen to uh, just go to the Facebook channel like it or follow it and then when I go live you'll should get a notification or check it out but I'm pretty prompt on the 8 o'clock p.m. all right guys so um, why did I say that you know pretty much the people don't care about real estate anymore because guess what we're seeing home buyer sentiment hitting like record lows. So uh, this is a chart uh, from the article off Zero Hedge, and you've got two things going on, going on here. You've got home buyer sentiment, which typically is a, um, uh, I guess, a survey that's conducted by the University of Michigan. And then you've got the home builder sentiment, with which, which is a national association of home builders. So both categories or both groups have basically hit you know a low point and clearly the home buyer sentiment has been dropping you know fairly consistently uh and you can see that the home builder you know has has jumped a bit but it's on its way down again so this is pretty much indicative of where the market is right now and clearly there's a number of reasons why people are feeling so horrible about real estate also fannie mae does a national housing survey and basically consumers are increasingly adamant that it's a good time to sell why because prices are so high but it's a bad time to buy a home why because prices are so high so really um, this is what's going on here so that also contributes to the home buyer sentiment being again it's home buyer sentiment so too high not flexibility um, etc except that's why people don't want to do this anymore and, and it gets to you right and as I mentioned on numerous videos you know I, I don't remember where I saw this survey but the number one most stressful thing that someone will experience their life is buying a house. So it's kind of sad when we, when now buying a house, which should be a um, happy occasion for your life, your lifestyle, family, whatever it is, it's now viewed as the worst thing that, you know, the most stressful thing that one's going to go through in their life, which is not very fun. All right. Um, here we got something else that says, you know, forward looking US building permits plunged to an eight month lows. Uh, in June, so amid a slew of weak housing sales data because things are slowing down, uh, weak mortgage applications, we've seen them dropping, crashing home buyer sentiment, which we just saw, and an 11-month low on home builder sentiment, which we just saw as well too. Analysts still expected both housing starts and permits to rise month over month in June. They were half right. So after a small downward revision in May, housing starts soared 5.3% month over month in June. Uh, be the expectations, but building permits, which are forward-looking, of course, saw a third straight month of decline. So there you go. So really, uh, um, and you know, this pushed the permits single annual adjusted um, rate below starts for the first time since January 2020, and, and it's to the and it's the weakest since October 2020. So we can see the home building markets having its share of issues right now. Not a pretty picture for the future. Why exorbitant material costs combined with shortages of land and labor have thwarted developers sinking seeking to ramp up construction so people need homes but developers and builders can't do it fast enough can't get their hands on stuff so supply concerns and a slowdown in sales push builder confidence down to 11 month low in july um, basically inventory crunch um, fall uh, saw demand last year to set prices soaring of course tempering buyer interest a record 71 percent of consumers said higher prices were a reason why buying conditions have soured all right, so exactly what I just mentioned a few minutes ago. So that's the whole point. If things are becoming, you know, 
we've got low interest rates. You've got new programs out there trying to cater to different markets. The FHA low down payment, new new no down payment loans. So we can see the mortgage industry and the government scrambling to get buyers to buy. But it just comes a point in time when people go, I've had enough. And I think we're at that point right now. So now this is where things start to change, which is always very interesting. That's where we sort of wanted to go here. Um, you know, on another note, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, loan modifications reach a pandemic high. So people that, uh, and what loan modifications are is you're not paying your mortgage, need some assistance. Um, you go to your lender and say, hey, you know, I need you to see if you can modify my loan to make it more acceptable for you and for me. Well, people who are in forbearance, so as people exit forbearance programs, if they still have financial difficulties, they're going to jump into these loan modification trials and programs, and that's sort of the next step. And if that doesn't work, then it's unfortunate, then they're going to fall into the foreclosure bucket. But just interesting to see that, you know, Fannie and Freddie modifications are reaching a pandemic high. So unlike what you may hear in the media saying, oh, you know, our four, because forbearance numbers are dropping, they drop every week, okay? So, um, and what the news reports are saying is that's because of the great economy and all and jobs and whatever that people are able to leave and exit their forbearance. Well, as I said, leaving a forbearance program is a check mark in a column that's considered a win. It's after the fact where we don't know what's going on. So once, you know, hey, everything is great, people are leaving forbearance for for because the economy is good and they got great jobs. Oh well, they don't mention mm, but people are also jumping to loan mods now, which means they don't have financial stability and this is where this is how things go and how things unravel. So please Please keep this in mind um, when you're thinking about that type of stuff. Also, what I think is interesting is that, you know, as time goes on, more people are going to chime in about what's happening. So predicted for, you know, H2, signs of a housing bubble, uh, not agency lending growth. This is really more of the housing market perspective from a mortgage deal. But the biggest 20, 2020, the biggest 2021 problems for mortgage originators carrying through the second half of the year are the lack of inventory and the run-up in home values to record levels. So yes, that's obviously uh, both are big concerns for the president of some group which provides lender services. I hate to use that word because it's scary, but I think we're approaching bubble status on the appreciation of homes, all right? So I have to laugh at this because if people now are just saying we're in a housing bubble, We've been in a housing bubble for quite some period of time. So a bubble just, the bubble, it, it keeps growing and growing and growing. So for it, so, but now you've got people who really, I'm going to say are pro housing, which means let's talk about, you know, values increase and opportunities, the whole bit, get your mortgage, rah, rah. Now you got the mortgage people actually saying, uh, well, with lack of inventory, run up at home values, we are, you know, approaching bubble status. So it just goes to show that when I say, are we at an inflection point or things changing? You know, it's kind of like everybody's thinking this now, all right? And there's only so much narrative that we can hold on to and believe, uh, ultimately. Um, you know, we're talking young move-up buyers and first-time home buyers are out of the market because the value of a home is too high. So we're eliminating two classes of normal borrowers, and it kind of really frightens me, which is interesting. So that's that's right. So what is the underlying statement here? Well, it's the wealthy, the high credit, the great job people that can afford to buy these homes or they're relocating from higher price marketplaces and cash out coming down to other locations. So it, but the whole point though is that, you know, like it's, it's, we call this, you know, the start of the wealth transfer. So the wealthy, the, you know, and that's, and there's nothing wrong. Listen, if you're wealthy and you're doing good, good for you because you worked hard for it and that's great. I don't knock that whatsoever, but it's interesting the fact that you can see what market segments are hurting and the question would be how will those market segments evolve and what will happen to them as time goes on. So, I mean, you can use your, put your thinking cap on for that. Um, following up here, we're talking about foreclosures today. So, um, Adam Data Solution, you know, I guess you could say released their first half of the U.S. foreclosure activity chart um, and, and report. So, basically, ultimately what they're talking about, the government's foreclosure moratorium and mortgage forbearance programs have created an unprecedented situation. So yes, so they're actually saying this is not normal, okay? Historically high numbers of seriously delinquent loans and historically uh, low levels of foreclosure activity. Why? Because they just said forbearance, um, you know, and, and foreclosure moratoriums remain, mean that people are seriously, seriously delinquent and properties not moving through the foreclosure process. So on one hand, we have a surge in the distress. On the other hand, we don't have a release of the valve 
where you know I will call it, you know the housing nature will take its course and these things will kind of hash out. Uh, with the moratorium scheduled to the end of July 31st and half of the remaining borrowers and forbearance scheduled to exit the program in the next six months, we should start to get a more accurate read on the level of financial distress the pandemic has caused for homeowners across the country. So good. So. I like that statement because what it really means is that we don't know what's going to happen, okay? We see all the signs and all the issues, high delinquency, no foreclosure, something's got to give, and until this stuff opens up, which is really, you know, like a couple weeks away for it to really start to play out or starting the play out process, um, we don't know what to expect. Now, you know, between you and me and the fence post and a lot of other people that I talk to, we kind of know how it's going to play out and we're kind of preparing for that. And I can tell you that the number of inquiries number of people who I've spoken with over the past two weeks is out of control with respect to, you know, working together or, you know, like, you know, I mean, like groups saying we want to buy, are you in helping us, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the real people who are studying the data, the models, looking historically the whole bit, they know what's going to happen. And that's what, and so I'm just sort of emphasizing to everybody out there that watches this, that, you know, it you will know, we'll start to see some shifting. We'll start to see some, I guess I'll say some lower prices and some affordability as time goes on. But as we always say, there will be headwinds uh, that will be working to, to keep us at bay from these uh, opportunities. And that's part of the workaround that we have to discuss. Probably you know, we'll do that tomorrow night. Okay. Um, just of note, Delaware, Illinois, Florida post the highest foreclosure rates. So, you know, the foreclosure rates are basically they calculate going how many foreclosures, you know, per, you know, like, again, nationwide, you know, 0.5% of all housing units. Uh, and one, you know, one in every two, 2012 housing has had a foreclosure fine in the first half of 2021. So they, they do it by like a per capita or per volume basis, okay? So Delaware, Florida, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, um, typically we're seeing stuff that you know, they're the highest ones. Other states with rates among the 10 highest nationwide were New Jersey, Nevada, South Carolina, Louisiana, New Mexico. So really, when I take a look at those states with the high foreclosure rates, there's no surprises there whatsoever, all right? These are your typical states that go through the same process and usually are the leaders in foreclosure rates, volumes, um, activity, etc. So there's no surprise there, all right? Highest metro foreclosure rates were in Lake Havasu, Cleveland, Macon, Georgia. So we've got, you know, a population of over 200K highest foreclosure rates first half of the year. Lake Havasu, Arizona, Cleveland, Ohio, Macon, Georgia, Peoria, Illinois, Florence, South Carolina, uh, which is, again, a state, so that's, you know, the states are kind of there that we had previously. Other metro areas that ranked the top 10 were um, McAllen, Texas, uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey, Davenport, Iowa, Shreveport, Louisiana, and South Bend, Indiana. So I look at, you know, um, Davenport, Iowa was the one that would stand out to me saying, okay, I don't really hear about too many things going on in Iowa just because of the nature of how things work out there. So that's interesting. But when you get, <coughs> excuse me, again, Ohio, Georgia, South Carolina, Indiana, um, you know, New Jersey, all those locations are typically your, your top top tier um, states and metros where you have problems here, right? Now, foreclosure starts are down 63%. So yeah, so why are foreclosure starts down 63%? Because of the moratorium, all right? So basically, um, that's what we're going to see. The states that saw the greatest decline of foreclosure starts saw Maryland down 95%, Oklahoma 87%, Pennsylvania, Idaho, New Mexico. So the foreclosure starts. Now, a foreclosure start is basically a foreclosure filing. So if the courts aren't open or processing and the lenders aren't pushing it forward to start the process, then obviously we have a decline in the volume, etc. Now, that's all going to change in the next little bit. Right, so things will be picking up, and there's different layers to this, but of course it will pick up. So without having foreclosures in process, therefore what? Bank repossessions are down to its lowest level because there's nothing for the banks to repossess. So repossession basically means it goes to foreclosure auction. Nobody buys it as a, at the auction as a third-party bidder, and the bank takes it back. It's a bank repossession. Lender foreclosed REOs, real estate owned. So clearly that is at its lowest level right now because it's exactly proportional to having the lowest amount of foreclosure uh, being processed as well. So this all makes sense here. So don't, don't be swayed and think this is a, you know, this means the market's great. It's just behind the scenes where it's all going to let loose in the next little while here. All right. Um, as I said, the Q2 2021 foreclosure activities below pre-recession averages 92% of the market. So they're comparing, you know, um, what we've just gone through, which is really the pandemic still closing down the foreclosure process for the majority of, lo of locations across the country. Some have opened up and start to move forward, et cetera. But now they're comparing going 90, you know, 
um, yeah, we're below big time pre-pandemic numbers, all right? And I got to tell you this as well, too. Just before the pandemic hit, foreclosures were actually starting to increase. So things, the cracks were already there in the housing market. Uh, it just, it didn't manifest because everything came to a halt. So you got to be aware of that. And that's what's going to happen as time goes forward. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, if you could certainly help my channel grow and subscribe, I'd really appreciate that. Secondly, I know I've said it a couple of times, but please check to see if you're still a subscriber. If you're not, smash that subscriber button because things have been happening to my channel and uh, need to keep growing. So I appreciate that very much. And we hope to keep moving forward with good information here. So average foreclosure timelines increased from last year. Now, I want to be careful about this. So if a home is in the foreclosure process, but the process has been what? Stalled, delayed, put on hold, etc., then the average time to complete a foreclosure will increase and you know increase as well too. Because you know the the, uh, the average foreclosure timeline for foreclosures completed in 2021 were Hawaii, 3,000 days, New York, 1,800 days, Indiana, 1,600 days, Wisconsin, 1,500 and change days. New Jersey, 1,471 days. So those are typically judicial states. The process is longer. But again, if if the courts aren't moving stuff forward because of moratoria or the lenders aren't pushing things forward because they're they, they, they want to sort of you know be good, you know, good neighbors and not have people with extra cash in their lives and push them out during the pandemic, then the average is going to increase here. So please be aware of that. So this is not just the fact that hey, this is the average, it's, it's a higher average for a reason. The average is 922 days. So obviously, states that are judicial have a longer process are going to show higher. States that are what we call trustee have a shorter time frame. It could be three to six months. Okay, so it's all going to balance up. But I can tell you right now that prior to the pandemic, what I was seeing in Florida was a significant increase in um, the time frame. It was getting shorter and shorter uh, of what I'd see a foreclosure uh, case get filed to where it actually went to the auction. So the lenders don't want them to do 3,000 days or 1,500 days, all right? The lenders want them to go fit faster. So we have lenders who are speeding the process up. Various courts and Supreme Courts across the country have also sort of mandated to their local county and civil courts that, hey, we're going to see some volume, so you can't mess around anymore. So the, the days of you being in your home for 10 years are kind of over, maybe even five years too, okay? So realize if you're not defending your, um, your foreclosure with an attorney, things are going to move fast. And, and that's the point because the foreclosure auction is the number one disposition strategy that benefits the lender. They actually don't want to take these things back. They'd rather you buy them at the auction for a premium. All right. So that's why this is somewhat of a, of a bit of a red herring here. And when we talk about the housing narrative, when people say why we are not going to have a housing crash and crisis, it's because they look at this chart and they say, well, you know, if it takes 960, 22 days on average, that's all what almost three years. So surely in that three year time frame, people can sell their home and cash out with their equity, blah, blah, blah. Well, realize that those 922 days, I think is inflated, but also you're chipping away at the equity over those 922 days every month as well too. And, um, you know, that's just not going to happen. All right. Things will be changing. So we, we look at the information we're given today and we have to make some assumptions. And then there's, then there's the underlying sort of logic and sort of, you know, what's happening behind the scenes that's going to change us as we go forward. All right. Just some examples here with respect to those, you know, the foreclosure, you know, rates. So obviously there's, you know, the 50 states here, you know, Delaware was number one state, Florida, number three state, Illinois, number two, Indiana, number five. So this is an alphabetical order. So you can take a look at, you know, where things rank. Arizona, number 26, Arkansas, number 37, Colorado, 46, you know, Idaho, 43. So the states that basically are lower on the foreclosure activity typically are ones with the more equity or there's been a lot of surge going on in growth in those states. So we don't see as much distress as well. Um, Kansas 45, Kentucky 28, Louisiana number 9, Maryland number 19, Massachusetts 29, Michigan number 40, right, Minnesota 39, Nevada number 7, okay, New Jersey number 6, all right, so we start seeing uh, some, you know, some movement there, um, New Mexico number 10, New York surprisingly number 35, I think it's, and now, you know, normally New York has a significant amount of foreclosure volume, but it's because of the multiple layers, so they have a, you know, the CDC um, was, you know, they have the um, well, the, the government foreclosure moratorium, you got the CDC guidelines, the state has their own moratorium as well too. So basically when you have some states that have more levels of moratoria going on um, are, are going to be stuck. But New York, you know, it's more of a judicial state, but and it's got a huge vast number of, of pre-foreclosures. But I guess those, you know, the constraints are on top of them. Ohio, number four, um, South Carolina, number eight, look at Texas, 30, Utah, 25, South Dakota, number 48. Some locations just don't have a lot of foreclosures based on 
everything based on what's going on with the housing market, relocation, people, you know, uh, jobs, situation, etc. So just the way it plays out. But, you know, typically, you know, the top 10, it, 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 they're, they're familiar, okay? Um, so don't be surprised. And But again, as time works its way through, starting at the end of July and moving forward, um, you know, things are going to happen. So obviously, Vermont, you know, um, West Virginia, the lowest levels of foreclosure activity, you can see Wyoming, Wisconsin, Virginia kind of in the middle there. Okay, Washington State, number 41. So really, you know, we're not seeing a heck of a lot in a lot of these states. And, you know, look at Vermont had 20 filings. Okay, that was it. Um, so not a heck of a lot, <laughs> you know, on a per cap, you know, on, a, on an actual filing basis here. Now, foreclosure rates. So again, this is, you know, some of the locations that, that we talked about. So Macon, Georgia had the highest foreclosure rate, um, you know, of, of that metro location. Followed by Cleveland area, Peoria, Illinois, Las Vegas, Henderson, Paradise. So Vegas is picking up. I see the stats on that. Pensacola area here in Florida. Florence, South Carolina. I've been through there. Uh, Mobile, Alabama. Bakersfield, California. So we actually have a California uh, location. Bakersfield, for whatever reason, always has high foreclosures in that area. Uh, Champaign, Urbana, Illinois. So you can see that, you know, it's kind of a set, you know, when you look at, you know, what are the what are the obvious ones here? The, the Illinois, the Ohio, South Carolinas. The outliers would be the you know Bakersfield, California, basically. Okay, and, and actually, as I said, Las Vegas. You know, Las Vegas was you know what I call one of the Sun Belt states. We had the Sun Belt states got cream last time. California, Nevada, Arizona, Florida were huge foreclosure um, you know marketplaces, and you know everything kind of you know depending on you know, how people are moving back and forth and transitioning, things change a bit. But now we see uh, Vegas picking up. And I get the stats for Vegas and some of the West Coast stuff here, so I can see that has, has increased as well too. And there's going to be some great opportunities there as, as time goes on. So that's what we got going on. And just to show you how confusing this can be, because quite frankly, I understand the market fairly well and I understand how it's difficult to follow. Because on one hand, you know, like look, you know, U.S. properties with foreclosure fines for six months hit an all-time low. So some of the analysis is like it's low, and then oh, you know, May foreclosure starts up 36% year over year. So you see, it depends on how they're looking at it. How they're calculating this and using the statistics and the data. What time period is it? A you know a quarter or a half year or is it a month? You know what I mean. Look at zombie zips. Top ten most zombie zombie foreclosures increased twenty one percent across the nation second quarter. So you see, it's it's isn't it? It's actually it is confusing. Um, I don't. These guys are good with the data, and I'm not suggesting they're, they're they're misleading. But you can see that if you're just jumping in, taking a quick look at the headlines. So you would go, what is going on here, right? I'm, I'm getting information from one source that says this, one source says that. Housing narrative tells me everything is going to be great and okay. Who do I believe? And that's the problem right now. But my issue is that, guess what? We're being lulled to sleep. And, and really, the, the I guess you could say the, the point is to keep us not focused on this and focused on, hey, prices are going up. Interest rates are great. Jump in now. Get that house. Buy, 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 buy. That's what they want you to do. They don't want us to realize that something's coming down the road. And as I said, you know, when you have um, low interest rates, um, you know, 100% down loans, high debt to income ratio, um, or low down payments at the peak of the marketplace being pushed, tell me that's not going to be an issue as time goes on, especially when we know uh, the amount of FHA delinquencies because we talk about it every month. You see, so to me, this is all the information I kind of put in my head and I go, okay, you know. If, if you want, if you choose to ignore it, that's your business. Uh, there are those who don't choose to ignore it, and they'll figure out how to take advantage as time goes on. All right. So as I mentioned, tomorrow I got the Housing Bubble 2.0 live presentation. So please tune in for that. Um, I'll do a presentation. It's interactive. People ask questions. I do Q and A. Um, you know, so um, definitely check it out. And and you know, if you can, great. If not. I know why. I'm not offended. Okay, don't be offended. I'm on this medium. It's just it's cheap, easy medium, and it actually works. Um, some things I don't want to talk about on a larger platform. Simple as that. But having said that, there's things underway to, to start doing some of these things that are more intense and more data and more more real free flowing discussions on on some different platforms. All right, so we're working on that right now. So just if you can check that out, that would be great. Um, now, how much is the stress volume? And you know, I was at an event last night. Um, doing a lot of that now, a lot of speaking events, a lot of webinars, a lot of you know virtual meetings where I'm involved in now, and people just asking the question, go, what do you think is going to happen to the housing market and what's going on here? So I give my two cents worth, and I talk about my experience and talk about other investors that I know very well or know of, and we we discuss and where they're coming from. So the distressed volume is the is the question. I think we're minimum four million foreclosures. People have said maximum ten to eleven million. Uh, this volume can make a difference. Yes, it can, as I always say, but. It's what everyone's waiting for. Okay, so Wall Street and the big hedge funds have their money put aside. They're waiting to deploy this. 
we have to get ahead of the game. We have to get ahead of Wall Street. There will be headwinds, and that's the thing. So if you're, you know, we're in a housing bubble. There's no like, there's no debate about the bubble. Okay, so if you're still, if you think we're not in a bubble, you need to relook at where, where you're coming from. Okay, no, there's no debate about the bubble being here and prices being out of control. Okay, I think we all can agree upon that. It's the the question is, and I guess you could say the unknown part is how it's going to unfold. That's where you know we have to play the chess game and try to figure stuff out. So there will be headwinds. There'll be things designed to prevent us from participating in that marketplace. Uh, but we can work around it because we worked around it last time, and we'll, we'll find a way this time as well too. All right. Um, why do you want to do that? Because you know, look at this here. This is my Tampa MSA here. Median sales price of single family home in May was 322k and change. Median sales price for a short sale was 264. Our foreclosure area was 246. So you can see just based on the short sales. 59k in equity not even trying to push that down okay so if you work in this kind of distressed business yes you can just dis get discounts you just have to do things correctly position things correctly i'm going to tell you this right now you going to a listing agent with a short that has a short sale listing um it's not going to be the same like, like how can i put it like it's not going to like you're not you know what i mean like it's they're not working for you. They're working for the seller and they want to just get the thing closed out. So that's why we can get much better discounts on the things that we do with our stuff. Just in case you wanted to know about that, um, obviously you can reach out to me because I got things in the go. Big push on it now. Whoop, I keep going by this so quickly, hitting the, the keys here a couple times. Uh, anyway, obviously, you know, I've got training on, on short sales and, um, you know, not paying retail and other things that go in the marketplace. I got my premier product, short sale cash connection. I got the zombie flip, foreclosure flip, which is the entry level. So if you want information on this, let me know. Just reach out to me as I just showed you the other slide here. Um, I'll tell you how to engage the distressed housing market. Connect with me. Send me an email. Make sure I've got your phone numbers and stuff and we can chat. Uh, one more thing too. Um, if you want to know what's happening in your marketplace, I have a partnership with foreclosure.com. So go to gethousingdata.com gethousingdata.com. You can find the number one place for distressed property listings across the U.S. Why is this important? Because it's not that much money to check out what's happening in your own backyard to figure out how you're going to participate as things change because we're getting close to the end of July and once July ends, it will start the opportunities uh, and things will start to move. Now, please don't expect that we're going to see a million foreclosures hit the market in July. It's not going to happen, but the um, the disintegration of what was going on will start to evolve and manifest and will start to, start to play out. So get in now on the ground floor, figure this stuff out before the masses get here. I can tell you what happened last housing crisis and how it played out. I'll tell you what's going to happen this time through. People did jump in that and this, and you know, this could be the one last opportunity to get reasonably priced properties uh, before things in the environment change. So, all right, guys, thank you once again uh, for the views. Uh, please like the video. That helps my channel grow as well, too. If not a subscriber, please subscribe. Um, look forward to uh, chatting with you in a couple of days, all right? Take care.